Uh, warning, I'm not a category theorist. Uh, so if you see anything that's like obviously a special case of something way more general, and you want to know why I didn't use it, it's because I don't know about it. Um, <laughs> so let me know, and it'll save me a lot of time. Um, great. So the thing we're trying to do is help scientists um, kind of with AI technology and uh, build AI that can understand scientific thought and reasoning. Scientists spend a lot of time implementing models on computers, and uh, we want ways to represent these models. Okay. So they write a lot of papers, these scientists. Don't mean scientists like chemists, biologists, so like physicists. I don't know if they spend a lot of time writing papers. Uh, they already know category theory, so we don't have to help them. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> these applied scientists they write these papers, and then they want to reuse these papers in an automated way. So this is a field called machine reading, where you read scientific papers, and you know things about the world, and then you reason about the things you learned. The problem is the papers aren't information dense enough for a human to re reproduce the paper. Um, so the thing that does have precise meaning that scientists write is code. They write code that implements their models. Okay. Um, and then uh, I'll give you a little overview of how I think about science, and you might think about it differently, but this is the process we're trying to model. So, uh, and you might recognize this machine learning kind of notation here, where you make some objects some observations, x, y pairs, and you want a function that will give you y given an x. And you want to learn this by minimizing over some law or minimizing a loss over some set of models. And scientists call this parameter estimation. Machine learning people call it learning. Uh, but then there's this bigger process going on with the institutional process of discovery. So this is a process that goes on where we want to maximize the explanatory power of the optimal solution to the regression problem. So you're now you're optimizing over a class of models. Or sorry, each thing in here is a model that has parameters. So you're first picking the best model that has the best parameters. And this is kind of no, like notional, uh, so it's not a precise description of what scientists do. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe I'm just misreading. Do you want L star or, or Y star? Oh, sorry. So L star is the minimum, but I'm interested in the thing that minimizes as well, the argmin. The argmin gets plugged in here. Again, this is just notional, so don't worry if uh, it's not precise. Uh, just think of what they're doing is I'm trying to find the model that has the best parameters. So this like two-stage process. Um, and in machine learning, this second process is called structure learning, often. So each model, you learn parameters, and then you have this higher level process of learning what structure, like what model should I have used. Okay? And we care about things like generalization, parsimony, and consistency with the fundamental principles of the field. Okay? And scientists don't like to write code. <laughs> so what they do, well, a very small fraction of scientists love to write code, and the vast majority hate to write code. And so this has created kind of an economics where what they do is they write modeling frameworks. Um, so depending on the domain, somebody gets a good idea, say, all models in algebra, say linear algebra, I have a way to represent models in linear algebra. And this happened in the early 80s, and, and we got MATLAB. Somebody said, kind of polynomial, like, uh, Symbolic algebra, we got Mathematica. In statistics uh, and machine learning, you have Stan and TensorFlow. Um, these are kind of Bayesian statistics. Stan is a framework for writing Bayesian models. And if you, if you are a statistician and you don't like to write code, you code up your model in Stan, and then Stan will do this regression for you. Okay? Same with TensorFlow. The fraction of people who can actually code high-performance neural nets is very small. The, of the people who want to use high-performance neural nets. So we have TensorFlow. Optimization, and then what I'm presenting here, semantic models. And kind of, you can think of semantic models as a framework for writing modeling frameworks, a meta framework, if you will. Okay. And another reason we care at all is that, like, why don't we just use deep learning for everything? 
Uh, there are universal function approximators. And if you have enough data, and you have enough GPUs, and you have enough money, you can learn everything with deep learning. And the reason is that machine learning models are not, while well, universal, they're not mechanistic. So they don't explain anything. And you know, we talked about this yesterday. Um, <laughs> so we want models that explain things. Great. So here's an example of a model called the SIR model of disease. You assume that there are people who are in one of three states. Every person is either susceptible to the disease, they have the disease and they're infectious, or they have recovered and they have some kind of immunity. Right? Like chicken pox satisfies this, this model. Um, and you, you can draw it as a petri net. Scientists will naturally draw diagrams like this in every domain of science. That's why string diagrams are so great. Everybody knows that <laughs> now. Um, and then they can be converted into mathematical formalisms, like differential equations. So these differential equations encode a continuous dynamics that can be represented by that petri net, right? Oh, and I should say, before I move on, that in order to actually use this model, you have to first, as a scientist, you have to first convert it into differential equations. Then you have to pick these beta and gamma coefficients. And then you can, then you have a function that you can run to simulate. Actually, there's one more step. You have to turn the differential equations into code. And that's, that's what I care about. <laughs> okay. uh, so in case you think the SIR model is a toy model that nobody cares about, uh, this is a paper from 2017 studying Ebola, uh, the, a picture from a paper. And uh, they look at three different countries where Ebola is going on, and they estimate these beta and gamma terms from data. And you see that in different countries, they have different beta and gamma that depend on some social factors and economic factors in the country. So this is people using a toy model that was invented in the 1920s today, 2017. Um, so the code that, that these models correspond to is code that looks like this. Um, you have some, I'm going to use differential equations to make my models. I'm going to represent the right-hand side using some Julia function. So this code is written in the Julia programming language. Um, and this is kind of imperative, right? I access arrays. I do some arithmetic. I do some sets, set, uh, set index stuff. And then I initialize a model. Sorry, this runs off to the bottom of the screen. but And then I solve it. And all scientific modeling codes have this structure. You declare the problem you're trying to solve, you plug in some parameters, and then you call some complex solver that you don't understand because you're a scientist, not a programmer. <laughs> uh, OK. So we can take Julia programs and analyze them. It has a kind of static analysis tools built in. So I want to start from this program. The scientist will hand me this program because they wrote it. And I want to start from this program, and I want to know what model does this code compute. Uh, and so you can draw the type system of Julia will give you this category here, where the boxes are the types, and the lines are functions. Okay. Here's another example of what a modeling framework would look like. So this is an agent-based modeling framework. It's kind of hypothetical. It's very simplified, so it fits on slides. Um, oh. So you've got a state model. It has some states that the agents can be in, some agents that will be in states, and transitions that move agents between states. And then you have a solver, which in this case just is return the solution. The solution to the model is whatever it is. <laughs> um, so uh, if that framework, you know, if you filled in the details in that framework, the scientists would write models that look like this. At first, they declare you know, what is the number of infected people? Um, what, is, what does an infection do? It moves a person. Um, yeah, it moves a person from susceptible to either infected or susceptible with some probability. What is uh, recovery? It, 
you either become, you stay, stay infected or you become recovered with some probability. And then there's this main function here, the entry point, that declares a model and calls the solver. Right. So that's just another example. So I think um, the most category theoretic way to describe what we're doing is we're writing lenses where the big system is code and the view is a model, right? So we want to go, I want to take a code and I want to get, so C1 is the code I start with, and I want to get a model M1, then I want to transform that model and I want to put it back into code and get a new code. Then I'm going to run that new code. So this is what I call model augmentation. Um, this is probably the, this is a special case of something that everybody knows about, lenses. <laughs> um, so what do they look like? So I want the models to be Petri nets. Okay. So this is like the ideal code. <laughs> this is what I kind of idealized code. If I could get scientists to write code that looks like this, my get and my put in my lens are really simple. Um, so you, it's like totally declarative and, and functional, except the solver might be super imperative, you know? Oh, and if, if you're thinking at this point, why don't we just have the scientist code in Haskell and everything will be easy? It's the getting scientists to code in Haskell. <laughs> um, I agree, if they could just code in Haskell, then, then it would be easy. Um, so we, we're meeting the scientists where they are. Right? And that's why we also uh, say that we want to take a code C1 instead of just having them write M1, the model. Okay. Cool. So we apply category theory in a software framework that you can use to build modeling frameworks. And then, uh, so once you have this M1 and M2, these models, you can think about converting them, not putting them back into the code uh, setting, but putting them into other categories like ologs. So given a model, that M M1 or M2, I should be able to generate an olog that describes that model. This is handwritten uh, based on the scientific expertise. And ideally, scienti if scientists could code in ologs or write ologs and put the ologs in their paper, these ontology logs by David Spivak, um, like if I wanted to, if I was one scientist and I wanted to explain my model to another scientist, I could write a bunch of prose, paragraphs and sentences, and then they could build a mental model of my model based on the sentences, or I could draw the olog, and then things make sense. So it's like an SIR model starts with an initial state, which has a susceptible population, which is a number. It has a parameterization, such as the infectious rate, which is a real number. It occurs on a time domain, which starts at the starting time and ends at the ending time, which are both positive numbers. It yields a solution, which is a function. Right? And so this is kind of a precise and compositional way to describe models that are, I didn't invent them, but I think they're useful. Um, but they also, they look a lot like the type graph of the code. So if you take the Julia code that runs an SIR model, solves an SIR model, the type graph, it kind of has the same things in here. But now the boxes are types instead of human readable descriptions. So I think uh, I have an intuitive sense that this has to be true, that you could pick functors, you know, define categories and pick functors between them, such that I can take a Petri net and Compute the ODE, take the PetriNet, compute the ODE, send it to code, use a compiler to get x86 assembly, or bytecode, and then run it. Or I could take the PetriNet and compute an ABM, and then get the agent-based model, and then turn that into code, turn, and then compile that code. Or I can take my PetriNet, turn it into an OLOG, turn that OLOG into a schema, turn that schema into a CQL database, and use connexus.io.ai that I owe AI, whatever it is, I could plug it into a, a database and then 
use a functorial query language to represent, to do data management, data integration. Actually, yeah. The bottom boxes are already in there as a built in example to work with state box because they're all country boxes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, cool. <laughs> question mark? Not question mark. <laughs> uh, great. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, semantic models is a tool in Julia. You kind of set up a lens between Julia code and your string diagram category or whatever you want to represent your models as. And then you can go back and forth between code and, and models. And, but I talked about transforming a model. Okay. By the way, just as an aside, we also have the thing from Pet Beat of Code to x86. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, yeah. So you guys are using it. We've been talking all week. It's been great. Uh, you know, you guys are thinking about uh, at Statebox petri nets as describing computation. We're thinking of the petri net as describing a physical system, such as a chemical interaction network or a biochemical interaction network. But yeah, parallel lines of research. <laughs> uh, great. So, um, out of John Baez's group, there's all this work on uh, double pushouts over structured cospans which let you rewrite models. Um, so if you take, this is an example with graphs, loop is to vertex as two things pointing to a loop is to two things pointing to a vertex. I, these naturally, I haven't seen anyone describe them as uh, reasoning by analogy, but I think they, a double push out is naturally a, an analogy. And if you're trying to sell it to scientists, you know, it's an analogy between models. Model, model A is to B as C is to D. I think they'll get that. <laughs> um, okay, so going back to our PetriNet model. Uh, so SIR, and I uh, probably should have walked you through this code a little bit more earlier. Um, the point is that it, it specifies like an S and an I turn into two I's. An I turns into an R. That's the little part of the code that is capturing the model. The rest of the code is necessary to do the computation. Um, but yeah, so then you kind of initialize a petri net model, you make a problem by binding that model to an end petri net, right? Um, but it could like test reachability or whatever you want. Okay. So now we've got a way for scientists to reason about models by analogy here. SIR is to this other model, SIRS. This is also a, this is a disease where you can become reinfected. So this span over closed petri nets captures what is to scientists intuitive. I go from a disease like chicken pox, where you become immune, to a disease like the common cold, where there is no immunity. You can get it reinfected. And that maps onto domain semantics for them, right? These are, you now have a category of models and relationships between models that capture uh, the domain semantics for the person. Okay. So this, like, so okay, let's put back into our code that we started with. Uh, S plus I goes to two I, I goes to R, R goes to S. And now we have our initial state. We're good to go. Go ahead. I have five minutes left. Okay. Cool. Whoa. Resume. Okay. Cool. So then double push out rewriting is model augmentation, is a way of specifying what do I want you to do with the model. I want you to apply the SIR is to, uh, here's a new model, SEIR. This is a um, disease with a latent phase where you're exposed, you're carrying the virus, but you are not infectious yet. So it's like when an infected person meets a susceptible person, you get an exposed person, and then the infected person goes back to being infected. Exposed people eventually become infected, and infected people become recovered. So SIR is to SEIR, as SIRS is to 
S E I R S. <laughs> uh, okay. And so this is implemented in software. Uh, this is like the contribution, and the result is that we have a Julia framework for building these things, uh, where what you need to specify is, you know, your category. You make these spans, and then you construct a DPO problem, which uh, then you solve by computing the two pushouts. And so these are the, the left part of the bottom pushout and the right part. So, yeah. SIRS, this thing on the bottom left, is SIRS. Yeah. Okay. And then, so you can put back into code, here you're good to go. Then you can uh, generate imperative or procedural code for the scientists. So the scientists don't write, they don't want to write functional programs, they want to write imperative programs because that's how they think. Um, It'd be great if we could just make everyone functional programmers. You know, we wouldn't have to do this. <laughs> uh, what's that? No. Yeah, program by Ologs. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we generate imperative programs. Then you can think of the Julia compiler as a map from Julia programs to x86 programs. And so then you can run the Julia compiler on that code I showed before, and you get out this assembly. And this assembly is not functional at all. It's just like moving bytes around and doing arithmetic and conditional logic. Right? It's like dead simple. Um, high, and so it can be high performance. And then another way you can do is you can take that alternate route, which is to compile the petri net to a system of ordinary differential equations to a system or to code that implements the ODEs to x86. Great. Yeah. So you can go from a petri net to ABM like code, or you can go PetriNet to ODE to code and get out a different program. <laughs> and, that, and that's important, right? We don't want these two paths to give you the same program. Cool. Yeah, so software works, and I, uh, it does something that I think uh, ACT, the ACT community should be aware of. Um, and I like to think of it as the codification of the categorification of science. And then I have a bunch of like, how general of a setting can this work in? <laughs> Which I think is super general. Um, great. So then acknowledgments. Uh, everyone in the, this community, especially Spivak Fong, guys, and Chikala? Sikala? Okay. Uh, Sikala, uh, my funding agency, DARPA, and my team, uh, Christine, Micah, Kuhn, and Shri. Um, and also Julia. Thank you very much. I'll take John's. <laughs> so you were, you had like a double push out of Petri nets, and then you were saying you could do that in code. You could sort of transfer that over to code. Yeah. Do you have, maybe you haven't been trying to do it this way, but you seem to be hinting that there's a functor from Petri nets to some kind of Code, yeah. It's a push out <laughs> uh, push out yeah. That probably seems like it preserving pushouts needs to be important. That like it would need to do that in order to work. Um, yeah. So all of this is is implemented, not proven. Mm -hmm. uh, that so like there is code that does this, and it the code works. It makes the models. So it must be possible. Whether the <laughs> the things it does are actual functors. Right. Um, so you can turn a <laughs> into, a, into code. I'm mean, asking these are Yeah, yeah. So you can, and, then if, and then if you do a, a push out of Petri nets, mm -hmm. and you have, then you can generate the code for each fork. So there's some yeah. push out square, and then there's some way to see the code in the, that's the push out, the yeah. code of the push out is being built from the code of the pieces. So yes. We're doing the composition in model space and then generating the code. Because doing the composition in code space is super hard. <laughs> it's not a push out 
Maybe you're doing the push out in the world of measurements and then it's just trying to get it to work. Right. Oh, yeah. So the, the relationship, yeah. I don't think what you have is a way to, you certainly don't have a practical way to take two pieces of code and say, what is the push out? That's because the code is wrong. That's because Python and Julia are terrible languages. <laughs> yes, but they're also. <laughs> well, I have, like, trust me, I did this for. I know, but uh, for instance, you get the example of Julia as a category. I don't think it's actually I, a category. Right, I don't think so either. It's just yeah. Not even, the type system isn't even like a type theory. It's not even close. Right. And that's where all of these issues. I mean, from. the the types that are the types and functions that are used in a specific Julia program. No, no, are like a finally Julia presented category, itself, right? I just took a quick glance. I mean, I did some in Julia. I was like, this can't be right. And then I looked at the type system. And that's not, it doesn't have things like product. It is just whatever people have in their mind that seems useful, they put in there. But they, because yeah. they don't know type theory, you're never going to be able to make a category out of it. Because all your functions are going to be like closely with whatever exception you can get. And so yeah. Like, so and that's what I'm saying. It's problem, right? It is not formal, like, there's no automated theorem proving. Oh, there's saying, none of the formalism. It's not formally verifiable software, but hopefully it works. <laughs> and, and I'm guided by practicality. So, David. So, can you automatically extract that text? Does Julia just automatically give you that text graph? So, press a button and you get it's a little bit subtle, but we have written the code that does that. Um, it's not built into the compiler, but it's easy to write given what is built into the compiler. Yeah. Um, so, just a question or a comment. So, you said you asked for this most general type of set in settings to the font, right? Yeah. And I think there would be MRTs covers. Yeah, the right. Topic. Like your talk, yeah. I was just wondering, are you using any options because I've used it in the rewrite of the solution? Are you using any sort of logic on the rewrite itself? I mean, do you have any compositions on the rewrite itself or applying them? Not yet. That's, yeah, not yet. So, who's the next speaker? So, do you want to come on yeah. to yeah. take, take another question? Do you want to take okay. another question? Yeah. So, uh, so the P tree and the ODE uh, elements that you showed in your code, mm -hmm. are those things that are written into your semantic models package, or are those things that are coming from Julia? So, they are, um, so the differential equation solver is a user defined library. The P tree net library is a library that we wrote, um, but plays the role of a user-defined library to our library. So it's not, it doesn't live within semantic models, but it integrates with. Yeah. Let me extend that question just a little bit, sorry. Yeah. Uh, how much work is it to add in the classic models? Yeah, so it's the writing the lens part. It's, that's the, the part that you need to do to integrate with a new uh, modeling framework. And so yeah, I think what we should think of as, I mean, hopefully a better category theorist than me, uh, being the null category theorist, uh, <laughs> is um, like this model augmentation process that scientists do naturally is a lens where the, the system is code, the view is models, and I'm do applying transformations on the models and I'm updating the, the system. Um, so. All right, uh, so thank you all for being here, especially uh, to the people that were in Edinburgh last week in my talk and decided it was so great they had to see it twice. Um, and I also want to thank uh, last year's ACT and ACT school organizers, because I would say in a way, my involvement in this project uh, was definitely because of the things that I learned at the ACT school. Um, so I certainly hope that that's an initiative that keeps uh, happening in the future. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work that we did with Brendan Fong about a recipe for black box functors. So let me start by telling you what it is that I mean by black box functor. Um, so across a lot of disciplines, people use network diagrams to model interconnected systems. And we've been seeing a lot of these uh, throughout the week. Uh, we have a picture uh, on the left that's an example of uh, an electrical circuit, right? We have some nodes and some uh, resistances. And over here we have an example of a chemical reaction or a Petri net as we've seen them named uh, in a couple of the talks. And you see that what these are is basically graphs, right? So we have the nodes, we have some uh, edges between them. And there's two special things that we can also see in the picture. One of them is that we are allowed to carry some 
extra relevant information in our graph. For example, in the case of the circuit, we have some resistance values. Or in the case of a chemical reaction, we may be interested in carrying around the rate at which the reaction takes place. And aside from that extra information on our graph, you see that we also have some nodes that are marked as special. And we mark them as inputs uh, and outputs. And what these tell us is uh, they give us information on how these networks are allowed to interconnect with each other. So the way we think about these is, say I have two circuits, and if the outputs of this one match the inputs of that one, then I'm allowed to wire the ports together to create a larger network, right? All right. So recent work has shown that we can use hypergraph categories to model um, the structure on these network diagrams. Um, and I'm not going to get into the technical definition of a hypergraph category, but the idea, just so you know what kind of structure we're talking about, is that these are symmetric monoidal categories where each object has a Frobenius structure. So each object has a monoid structure and a co-monoid structure, um, plus some extra algebraic loss that they need to satisfy. All right, so we're saying um, people use hypergraph categories to model these network diagrams. So how does that work? The idea is that the objects in the hypergraph category are, are going to model the boundary types. And by boundary, I mean all the nodes that are marked as inputs in out or outputs. And that the morphisms in the hypergraph category are going to model the syntax of these network diagrams. So that begs the obvious question, what happens to the semantics, right? And what we do in practice is that we build functors to other hypergraph categories that we use as semantic interpretation, right? Um, so these have to be what we call hypergraph functors between these hypergraph categories. So these are going to be monoidal functors preserving all this extra Frobenius structure um, in a very natural way. And the way we think about these networks and the way that we're going to think of them throughout this talk is that we have these networks with inputs and outputs. And we imagine that we can really only know them through their boundary. So if you want, imagine we have a circuit and we're allowed to plug in some type of measuring devices only in the inputs and outputs and collect data. But those are the only nodes that we can collect data on, right? So the way we think of these networks is we can really only know them through their interactions with each other. So we only know them through their boundary. And coherent with that perspective, what happens when we do this semantic interpretation by taking a functor out of them to another hypergraph category is that they will have the effect of hiding the internal structure that we can't see from the boundary, right? And that's why we call them black box functors, because what ends up happening is we end up with a situation like in the picture where we can see the boundary nodes, but we don't really know what's going on inside, because it's not we can access that from the boundary. All right, so these are the black box functors that I'm going to be talking about, these hypergraph functors that give us a way to do semantic interpretation. So let's talk a little bit of how we construct hypergraph categories before we get to constructing hypergraph functors. So the key idea is going to be to use cospans. Um, if we start with a finally co-complete category C, then we can always define a category cospan C having the same objects as the category C and having as morphisms, isomorphism classes of cospans, so diagrams of this shape. Um, then uh, we can compose cospans by taking the pullback, and that's where the iso classes becomes important so that everything works correctly. Um, and we also have a symmetric monoidal structure inherited from the coproduct that we had in C. All right, so 
what do these cospans have to do with our uh, network diagrams? Well, remember that we said the morphisms in the hypergraph categories capture the syntax of the diagram, and that's what cospans are going to do. So imagine we have a Petri net like in the picture, then that would correspond to a cospan where the feet of the cospan are used to mark the inputs and the outputs, and we record all the species involved on the apex of the coal span. So we can see that this is capturing important information, but clearly not all of it. So there's a flaw um, in our, in our coal span model, which is that there's more information in that picture that we can't see over here. For example, we can't find the rate alpha anywhere or even we can't really know which uh, chemicals are going into the process and which ones are coming out. We just know which ones we mark as inputs and outputs. So to uh, be able to carry that information with us, we're actually not going to work with co-spans, but with decorated co-spans instead. So what's a decorated co-span? That's a pair <coughs> consisting of a co-span together with some extra information on the apex. And we use the second coordinate here to plug in all the extra data that we need to record to make our system meaningful. All right, now the issue with these is we said if we have co-spans, then these are going to form the morphisms of a category because we can compose them by doing push out. It's not clear what's going to happen to this decoration, this extra info, when we try to compose, right? This, this needs to be given in a coherent way for these to make the morphisms of a category. But lucky for us, we have a theorem due to Brendan saying if the decorations, um, which is what I'm going to call the extra info, are given through a symmetric lax monoidal functor from C to Z, then indeed, we can form a category which we'll call F cospans for cospans decorated by F, um, having the same objects as the category C, and having these decorated cospans as their morphisms. Right? So what we're saying is we can give the decorations in a haphazard way, but if we find a way such that we can build a monoidal functor taking an object in C to the set of all possible decorations we might be interested in, um, then we can, we can take this uh, category of decorated cospans. And also, this is going to be a hypergraph category, which is the kind of structure that we're interested in, um, with the monoidal structure inherited from the coproduct in C, just like cospans. Right, so now we have these decorated cospans. They do record all the relevant information, but these also have a flaw, which is that they're not very efficient. Because remember that we said we think about these networks as only being accessible from the boundary. But what's going to happen is that, say, we have three decorated cospans like that. When we compose them, we're going to be keeping track of a lot of inner structure that we can't see anymore in the composition. Um, so we're not being very efficient, and what we would like to do is to have some notion of control as to how much information that we carry has to be reached by the boundary. So really, we want to control how much of these useless things we're allowed to carry around with us. So to fix that, um, we are not going to work with decorated cospans anymore. We're going to work with decorated correlations, and we're going to keep these. These are going to be the, the actual model that we'll be working with. So what are these? Well, we start with a factorization system, which is a pair consisting of two subcategories of C, such that every map in C can be factored as something in E followed by something in M. So you want to think epi-mono factorization in, in modules or in sets or something like that. And there's also some extra conditions that basically tell us this is unique up to, th this factorization needs to be unique up to ISO and functorial in a precise manner. Right, so if we're given a factorization system, 
we define an EM correlation as a co-span such that the universal map that we get from the co-product of the feet to the apex belongs to the class E. So how do you want to think about these? Well, you see that the maps in E control exactly how much of the apex has to be reached by the things in the boundary. For example, if we say that E's had to have to uh, consist of epimorphisms, then we would be saying we can only have cospans whose apex is reached, like everything in the apex has to be reached by the boundary. Um, and being more strict or more loose with the, with the factorization system allows us to relax, relax or constrict uh, this notion a little bit. Right. So just like we have decorated cospans, we also have decorated correlations. Um, and we have a theorem saying if we're given a factorization system and we have a lax monoidal functor from this CM up to set, and I'm going to write what I mean by, oh, whoops. There we go. So what I mean by this CM up, this is going to be the full subcategory of cospan C consisting of the cospans having this leg in C and this leg in M. That's what I mean by the CM up. So now we have that if we have a monoidal functor from CM up to set that's giving us the decorations, we can form a category F corel for correlations decorated by F having, again, the same objects as C, where now morphisms are classes of decorated correlations. So remember, this just means a pair where we have a correlation, so a co-span such that the induced map to the apex is in the class E, together with an element in the image of the apex. And once again, this is a hypergraph category with the same uh, symmetric structure inherited from the coproduct in C. Great. So now we have a way of building hypergraph categories. What's so great about these? Um, well, for these, we already have a recipe for black box functors. Um, so if we have two of these uh, f corel categories. We have an f corel and f prime corel, and, and we want to build a black box functor between them. We have a theorem saying, all right, if you give me a co-continuous functor from c to c prime, having this property, together with a monoidal natural transformation as shown in the picture, then out comes a black box functor from f corel to f prime corel. So, this is what we mean by a recipe. We have these two ingredients, the functor A and the natural transformation alpha, and we have this theorem producing a black box functor. Right, so first of all, why, why is this a thing that we want to have? Why don't we just go ahead and build the functor between F corel and F prime corel? Well, what happens is that in practice, correlations are not that easy to deal with sometimes. And building the functor, it's going to be usually made in an ad hoc manner that might even require some ingenuity for proving that it is indeed a functor. So if we, if we give it through this recipe, you see that we reduce the problem of working in the correlation world to just checking conditions in C, C prime, and set which should in practice be much, much easier to deal with. All right, so now if we have two of these F corel and F prime corel, we have this recipe for black box functor. What's the problem that we wanted to address? Well, it's not always the case that the two hypergraph categories that you want to work with are given through this decorated construction. So. Our question was, what happens if we have a hypergraph category given as F corel, but we want to do semantic interpretation in some other hypergraph category defined in a different manner, where we just give the monoidal structure and the Frobenius structure, 
we want to have a recipe for building functors between these as well. So we want to find a way to mimic what we had before, even if not both of them are given as f corral. And the solution that we propose is that instead of working in the category of hypergraph categories and hypergraph functors, what we should be doing is working in, a, in, in an entirely different setting. So what we do is we define the category deck data of decorating data. And now the point of this category is going to be to encompass exactly the information that we need to do the decorated correlation construction. So the objects of our category deck data are going to be tuples where we have um, a co-complete category C, a factorization system on C, and a lax monoidal functor from CM up to set, which remember is exactly what we need to apply the f rel construction. And the morphisms in our category are going to be the ingredients that we have for the, for the recipe for black box functors. So remember we said if we have a functor from C to C prime that's co-continuous, taking M to M prime, and uh, a monoidal natural transformation, then we get a black box functor. And these are going to be exactly the maps in our category. Right. So like we're saying, this is the data that we need to apply the decorated correlations construction. And indeed, we show that the decorated correlations construction is a functor from deck data to the category of all hypergraph categories. So this construction that we knew we had is now functorial. And our claim is that deck data is the right place to live. Now, if I uh, plan on substantiating this claim in any way, then the first thing I would need to show you is that there's a way of going the other way, right? Because what we're saying is, in practice, we're going to be given this f corel and this other hypergraph category. So if, if we're saying deck data is the place where we need to be, there should be a, a way to lift this hypergraph category to deck data, right? So how do we go in the other direction? Well, we can construct a functor alt from uh, the category of hypergraph categories to deck data. And I'm not going to get into the definition of this functor because it's a little bit more technical. Um, but the two things that I want to highlight about this functor alt are that we basically uh, modified a functor that was already in a paper by Brendan and Spivak. And we just tweaked it a little bit to fit uh, our conventions. Um, and the second thing that I want to highlight is that if one studies the things that we produce with this functor, we would see that we only really get decorating data with a trivial factorization system. So all the things that we're going to reach in that data have ISOs as the epi class. So what happens if we isolate this a category of deck data. Let's call it cospin algebras. This is going to be the full subcategory of deck data whose objects are C with this trivial factorization system on C and a functor F. So remember that the functor F was a lax monoidal functor from CM up to set, right? But now we're saying that M is the whole C. So CM up is simply cospan C. So now our functor is a functor from cospan C to set. So let me record that up there. So cospan algebra is the full subcategory of deck data whose objects are C and a functor from cospan C to set. And we said that we have this functor alt, which actually falls in cospan algebra. By definition, we obviously have an embedding into deck data. And in fact, there's a way for us to go from deck data to cospan algebra through a functor that we call con um, suggestively. So I'm going to tell you what this functor does on objects. If you have an object of deck data, so that's a tuple uh, like we see on the left, then we are going to keep the same category, right? And now our functor, our functor f that's given goes from cm up to set. 
and the functor that we need for the pair for cospin algebra should be from cospin C to set, right? So how do we build that? Well, we can always include this into cospin and take the left con extension. And it so happens that the left con extension is going to be monoidal, so we can take that as our cospin algebra. Right. So now we have this functor con, and of course we can consider the decorated correlation uh, construction restricted to cospin algebra, because we have that for the whole deck data, which is restricted to the full subcategory. And we show that, in fact, we have adjunctions, and furthermore, these compose to get our old corel functor. So the decorated correlation construction, construction is not only functorial, but in some sense it's factoring through this left con extension, um, which is pretty neat in and of itself. But having this very deconstructed definition of corel allows us to show quite easily that if we start with a hypergraph category H all the way in hype, we push it with alt to cospin algebra, we include it into deck data, and we apply the decorated correlation all the way back to hype, then the thing that we end up with is equivalent to H as a hypergraph category. And this is really easy to see once you have this deconstruction. So in particular, what are we saying? We're saying that every hypergraph category can be built up to equivalence of hypergraph categories from deck data by using the decorated correlations construction. In other words, every hypergraph category is of the form F corel up to equivalence. And then, of course, every hypergraph functor is up to equivalence, a functor between F corel and F prime corel for which we have the nice recipe. So what we propose is that if we have a hypergraph category and an F corel category, then instead of trying to build a black box functor ad hoc, the thing we can do is push both of them all the way to deck data, construct the morphism in deck data where we have this really nice description that should make it much easier in practice, and then push it back to hype where we'll recover what we started from up to equivalence. Thank you. So the, the forgetting, where we forget the, the what, the decorations? The spans. No, 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 no. We just, we forget the inner structure the that inner you structure. can't see from the boundary. So a white box functor is a full functor, I guess. It's just a normal functor. Uh, I, I suppose. Okay. Could you have gray functors? <laughs> um, so actually, if, if you look at people's paper, they, they have all kinds of uh, black box Colored in gray and black, striped. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure this are convention, honestly. Like the the black ones seem to be the ones that forget the most about what's going on inside, and usually a gray one preserves some of it. Yeah. We are thinking of jokes about fifty shades of gray. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna get into no, that, John. <laughs> How do you, how do you how what? Do you use relations, for example, to to um, I don't I don't think there's a there's an easy way for me to tell you, but 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 we can talk about it later because actually rel is the the one that we deconstruct in our paper as an example. Yeah. I have one more. Uh, do you have any uh, let's say easier intuitive examples where the class of maps is neither epis nor isos? 
easy intuitive example with it's neither epis nor isos. Um, so, so the ones that we were seeing here were uh, isos and C. Um, you can also take C isos. So this is neither epis nor isos. But this one, it's, it's not as silly as it seems, because it's actually quite important, because this one recovers the decorated cospans. Um, so, so we use this one to show that decorated cospans is an instance of decorated correlation. Just in the pocket? Yeah, we're good. Yep. Yeah. All right. And now i got to figure out how to, yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> so is it Briner? Briner. Briner. Yeah. Right. Uh, so 25 plus five questions. Sure, you'll give mission. me a flag. Yep. yep. OK, so uh, let's uh, bring on the last speak. Whoops. Looking forward to the discussion today and the everything that happens tomorrow as well. So I'm going to be telling you a little bit about uh, operatic diagnosis for hierarchical systems. Uh, there's not going to be any new math in this talk. I mean, maybe new for the conference, but I didn't invent anything. So you can really lean back and relax a little bit. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I'm, I'll tell you a little bit about systems in general, which is probably stuff you already know. Then I'll tell you a little bit more specifically about the particular system that we want to look, look at in this talk. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, modeling that guy using an operator port graphs and then applying that perspective in attaching some probabilistic and possibilistic semantics. Uh, so let's see, uh, I should basically say that really what we're trying to do here is produce something that is, let's say, slightly more, slightly less of a toy example than most of the examples that show up in our in, uh, papers. Uh, OK. so. Uh, I started off this project uh, just sort of thinking about two different views that people like to draw of systems. Uh, so there's the hierarchical view where we sort of break it. We've got the, the LSI. This is the length scale interferometer. Uh, and so we can break it down into some subsystems. And then those subsystems have some components. And this is very useful for organization and abstraction. And then there's also this sort of um, compositional viewpoint uh, where we say, what are the things at the bottom? And, and also, how do they interact? And so both of these views provide uh, some of the same information, but also some different information. So in particular, you uh, have no notion of the higher level uh, abstractions like length system and temp system on the right. And you have no view of the interactions in the picture on the left. And so really, both of them are important in understanding how the system is going to work. Uh, so what is a system model? So a system is a collection of interacting components. But a component is also a system. So a system is a collection of interacting systems. And so a system model then should be a collection of interacting system models. Uh, and so then at the bottom, there are many, many different kinds of models that we need to consider. So we could have probabilistic models, operational models, geometric models, so on and so forth. And then we can also combine these in different ways so that we can put together differential equations and probability and uh, various other things. Uh, and moreover, those models, when we say they bottom out, they don't bottom out at the bottom level of the tree. They can bottom out anywhere. So we may have some model, some semantic models that describe the intermediate levels of our tree, as well as the things at the very bottom. Uh, so here's the length scale interferometer. So this is a precision length measurement system that's operated by NIST been operated since 1965 with continuous improvements uh, as it goes. It's accurate to better than one part in a million. So uh, it measures lengths that are up to one meter bars. And the error over that distance is about 0.7 micrometers. Uh, so this is just a, a sort of schematic picture of the, of the system. But I'm not really going to tell you what's there. We're, we will not get all of these components in our model because we're still really at the toy level. Uh, just a little less toy. OK, so what is a linked scale? So basically, customers from around the world send these things to NIST uh, to have them uh, measured for calibration. So a nominal length scale is going to be defined by two lengths. There's the total length d, and there's the division big D. And the division length little d, and it should be the case that one divides the other so that we have an integer number of hashes on there. 
Uh, and so now here's a little picture down at the bottom. Uh, but in the real world and a real length scale, we also have to worry about errors. So each one of these distances has an associated error. And that's actually what the LSI is designed for, is to identify these errors. And then uh, the customers then take these length scales back and use them to calibrate their own machinery. Uh, okay, so some basic interferometry. Probably everybody in the room knows this, but I figured I'd go through it just in case. Uh, so we start out, so this guy is uh, the interferometer. It sends a laser, and then the beam splits, and we bounce off a mirror here that's fixed, and we also bounce off a mirror on this movable chassis, and then the beams recombine, and we start from the initial marking over here, and we read the fringe count. Uh, so this is just a number that, it, that shows on the display of the machine. And as we move the chassis, the fringe count changes, and we can actually work out what the distances are by looking at how many times the, how many fringes went by, uh, together with the wavelength, the vacuum wavelength, is, along with the uh, index of refraction. That's what n is. And so we move it further, and we take, so we take these fringe counts at each uh, one of the markings, and then we use that to back out the errors on these, uh, these lengths. Unfortunately, uh, that naive picture has to be corrected in a couple of ways, uh, primarily due to temperature. Uh, so basically, there are two strategies that one can go through if you really want to get these uh, precise length measurements. Either you can suck all the air out of a chamber so that you really are working in vacuum, or you can leave the air in there and try and maintain the environmental conditions very precisely uh, so that you can correct for them. And so in this case, there's actually uh, two main effects that come up. So first of all, thermal, due to thermal expansion, the size of the scale changes. And so when I say that we want to measure the lengths on this scale, that's, actually, that's not really meaningful. Uh, we need to be a little more precise and say that we want to measure the length at specifically 20 degrees Celsius. Because at other, changes that, uh, at other temperatures, that length is different. Uh, but actually, more important than that even uh, is that the index of refraction is going to vary with the temperature, and uh, as well as the humidity and the CO2, but we don't actually control for those uh, in, the, in the system. We do control the temperature. And so in order to get the sorts of accuracy that we want, uh, the LSI spec actually requires that the internal temperature of the box be maintained to uh, two one hundredths of a degree, uh, which is pretty tough. Uh. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now I'll move on to port graphs. I guess I'm going pretty fast, so maybe we'll end a little early. Uh, okay, so uh, the, I'm calling them port graphs. Uh, they're also called wiring diagrams, so uh, David has done a lot of work uh, in this. And so this is just sort of a schematic picture of the system. Uh, so you can cut it sort of right along here, and the things on the left are the length measurement subsystem, and the things on the right are the temperature uh, regulation system. So here's the chassis that's moving back and forth. There's the interferometer, and I didn't really call it out when I did the picture, uh, but there's an optical system over here that's used to actually identify the lines uh, automatically. And then on the other side, so we have the box. So this is basically just an insulated box that uh, the measurement takes place in. And of course, there's lots of thermometers in there because we need to know the temperature very precisely. Uh, we also have to maintain the temperature in the ambient lab. That's to uh, point. Uh, to half a degree Celsius. And the way that the, we actually maintain the temperature is using a chilled water bath that circulates through the, uh, the insulation of the box. And then, uh, of course, these are linked up in various ways. And so these uh, wires here are basically uh, what, I, what I would call boundaries of the components. And when we link them up, that means, of course, that those two boundaries are sitting next to each other or have some uh, correlate some, I should say, equation uh, between the states along uh, of those particular types. Uh, OK, so uh, the pictures are nice, but if we really want to work with them concretely, we probably need some sort of uh, other description. And so we can describe a port graph combinatorially uh, in terms of, so uh, the C there is supposed to be the set of internal components. And then Q uh, are the internal uh, ports, so the ports of the components. Uh, P are the ports on the outside of the system, so I didn't draw the picture, but really there should be sort of a, another boundary around the outside, and so that's what P is. Those are the ports on the outside, and then each port, either on the inside or on the outside, port, points to a particular wire, and really wires should be in quotes because they're hyperwires, uh, like Mario was talking about in the last talk. And in fact, uh, this Q to W and P to W is essentially the same co-span that she was talking about. 
Uh, and in general, we're going to want all of these wires to be typed because we can't put a laser and hook it into a heat, uh, a heat. We can't take a laser boundary and hook it into a heat boundary. And so we need to assume that both the wires and the ports are all typed and that they all commute over the types. Uh, okay, and then when we want to compose, we do it by pushing out. Uh, so basically, if you think about it, uh, so we've got one big system on the outside, and now we're going to fill in uh, new, new architectures uh, for the internal components. And so the ports on the outside are going to stay the same. Uh, the components are going to be all of the, the sum over all of the, the intermediate components of the components that are underneath those. Uh, similarly, the internal boundaries, are, or the internal ports rather, are going to be the sum over all of the ports on the, on the inside of the lower level boxes. And so then what we're saying basically is that we use the ports in the intermediate layer in order to glue together the wires from the inside boxes and the wires on the outside box. And so that's all sort of uh, a little mumbledy jumbledy. It's much easier if we just draw a picture. Uh, so basically, uh, here is an outer component, uh, or sorry, an outer architecture rather, and then the bath is one particular component there. Uh, here we think about the bath as being the system and we've got some uh, subcomponents inside of those. And when we form that push out, we really just take this diagram and stick it in uh, into that black box and we get this thing down here. And of course we don't have to do it one at a time, we can do it uh, all together if we like. Uh, okay, uh, now one thing that I at least I had not seen uh, anyone say, probably because it's obvious to mathematicians, but it's not obvious to other people, is what equations in this operad mean. Uh, so, and what we came to see is that it's basically representing some sort of uh, coherence between superficially incompatible decompositions. So the tree that we've been looking at, at so far is this sort of functional decomposition where we're doing the length measurement on one hand and the temperature regulation on the other. And then we have the various components of those things. But we could also divide the system up in a different way. Uh, so we can take a control theoretic decomposition and just think about what are the sensors and what are the actuators. And if we do that, then uh, this is incompatible because both the temperature regulation and the length measurement have sensors. Both of them have actuators. But nonetheless, it's the same system. It's the same things underneath. And that's exactly what this operat uh, operatic equation expresses. Uh, so I should say, uh, OK, so I'm going to give some names to these things. So I, I haven't even said what an operat is. I guess I just sort of assumed everybody knows. Uh, basically, it's, it's a category except for composition is tree structured rather than either linear, like in a traditional category, or many, many as in a monoidal category. Here it's many one. And so trees are very natural. It's very natural for uh, doing trees. So I'm going to call phi this sort of top level. Uh, this is the arrow in an operad of the top level of the functional decomposition for function, uh, and then the length system and the temperature system. And then similarly, there's the control theoretic decomposition along with the sensors and the actuators. And so now we have an operatic equation that says that uh, when we take phi and we substitute in the description of the length and the temperature, we get the same thing as if we take the control theoretic decomposition and substitute in the sensors and the actuators. And so you can kind of see here that, right, so this is one of those high level decompositions and the red is the other. And so initially, this may sort of seem like just maybe a, a cute observation. But I actually think that this is, this is pretty important because the different perspectives, the different uh, abstractions that we have to work with can be useful in different places. Uh, so in particular, uh, for this system, if you're looking at the functional decomposition, this is very useful for expressing the requirements of the system. So in particular, I know that I want my length measurements to be accurate to a certain, uh, certain degree. And using that, I can back out the requirements on my temperature regulation. How, how much can my temperature vary? Uh, but on the other hand, when I, act, when I want to do control, uh, it may be much easier to sort of think in this abstract control theoretic perspective and just take all of my sensor observations together and use those to, uh, to generate my actions. But if we want to verify that our control scheme actually satisfies the requirements, we need some sort of relationship between those two. And that's what this equation gives us. Uh, OK, so now uh, one th another thing that I want to point out is that we need to actually extract 
the system architecture. So we have a big operat of port graphs, but we don't actually want to assign semantics to every possible port graph. That's not what we're that's not what we're interested in. What we need to do is we need to identify exactly the graphs that we're interested in and sort of pull that out as a faithful sub-operad. And then we want to assign meaning to just those pieces. And so this LSI operad that we're going to talk about today, it just has these seven maps and a single equation. And well, I'll say more a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, okay, so uh, now I want to start talking about attaching semantics to this. So basically, the, the port graphs are a syntax. They, they describe what are the pieces of the system and what are their interactions. And now we want to assign some sort of more concrete uh, calculation or computational meaning to them. And so uh, there is an operad of probabilities. So it's what I, what I tend to call a plain operad, meaning that there's just one object inside. And so an arrow, for, an arrow in this operad just means I have n inputs and one output. And so in this case, it's going to be just a probability distribution over n elements. And the composition is uh, conditioning, so multiplication of these probabilities. Uh, that's sort of easiest to see again in a picture. So I may, I, so the way to think about this is basically, if I have a failure in my temperature system, so if I know that I have a failure in uh, the top level, then I might say that there's a 10% chance it's a problem with, with the lab regulation system, a 15% chance that it's a problem in the box, and a 75% chance that it's a problem with the bath. And similarly, when I look inside the bath, I say, given that I know I have a, prob a problem in the bath, then I have 10% or 25% or 65%. And so now when we want to look at what happens to the composite, where we substitute beta into tau, then we just multiply those probabilities. And I think this is very intuitive. Uh, OK, but uh, meanwhile, back in the real world, so we, we have a functor that assigns failure probabilities to components. In the paper, I actually give all the numbers. And uh, let me actually, to editorialize a bit, I really want to encourage the people in this room, when they're writing for ACT, uh, Try and, try and give those examples that go all the way down to concrete calculations. Because even though that may not be very helpful for the mathematicians in the room, because we can often sort of see how those are going to go, it's very important for the people who are on the applied side to, to get all the way down to the, the nitty gritty. Uh, OK, so back in the real world, though, uh, this is actually not how we are going to keep track of these failures. Uh, it's much more common to keep track of failure rates. Uh, and so yeah, there is an operat of rates. It's also very simple, but it's simple in a different way from prob. So prob was simple in that there was sort of only one object, and it was very thin at the object level. Uh, rate is going to instead be thick at the object level and thin at the morphism level. So the objects are just uh, positive real numbers. And there's just one arrow between a collection, of a collection of r's and an s, just in case the r's sum up to s. And so that basically says that if your components fail at a collection of rates, then the system as a whole is going to fail at the rate of the sum of those things. But people actually don't keep track of failure rates either. They're much more likely to have mean time to failure. Uh, and that actually turns out to be an isomorphic operad, but it's sort of harder to work with because you've actually got some inverses in there so that rates and mean times to failure are related by, by an inverse. And in fact, that's also not what people keep track of. Really, they just want historical data. Uh, and so this is nice to have some, some sort of infrastructure at the level of our semantics so that we can make it easy for the person who wants to sort of just collect, collect, keep track of what they're doing. And then under the hood, we can sort of pass that down to whatever type of information we're actually interested in uh, in some particular situation. Uh, OK. So now fault trees uh, are going to, so, so far we've we sort of looked at where a problem is occurring, but we didn't look at why or what was happening uh, to that problem. And so uh, there's a very common method, uh, common approach in, in these sorts of uh, techniques where we use fault trees to describe both what the possible failures of a component are, as well as the sorts of causal relationships that, that might occur between them. Uh, so for example, there's a heater in the bath, and I might have a, a short in that heater. And that could lead to the bath temperature being too high, which would lead to the box temperature being too high, which would lead to this large uncertainty that we don't want. Uh, and it's a tree because, well, we could also have the bath level being too low, and that would also lead to the bath temperature being too high, and so on. Uh, but it's only, it's not really a tree because, it, oop, there we go, it could be the case, come on, 
that the bath level being low also lead, can lead to other types of problems. So maybe if the bath level gets too low, then the pump turns off, and now the temp temperature system turns off altogether, and that leads to our larger uncertainty. Uh, so it's not really a tree. Uh, and so we can represent all of this information now as another semantic functor, taking values in a different place. So uh, basically, the fact that it's non-deterministic means that we should be looking at a, a category of relations or an operat of relations, I should say. But we're going to basically build this operat out of monoidal categories. So uh, again, you probably all know, but if you don't, uh, any time you have a monoidal category, you can build an operad by just uh, taking the arrows of the operad to be arrows in the monoidal category, which only have one thing coming out the bottom. And so in this case, we're going to be working with uh, the category of relations with the monoidal operation of plus and, and the empty set as the unit. And so what that means, basically, is that if I have a failure at the top, this could be related to a failure in any one of the components down below. Yep. Uh, OK, so now we have a span of functors, right? So on one hand, we have this map going to prob that tells us if I have a failure in this component, how likely is it that I have failures in the components below me? And I have another map that's saying, for each component, what are the possible ways that things can go wrong? And what are the possible ways that things going wrong in one can lead to uh, things going wrong in another? And so this gives us a kind of a syntactic relationship between the models because we've identified uh, what components, uh, sort of the, the structure of the components uh, associates certain probabilities and certain relations. Uh, but we would also like to relate these things semantically, right? It's, it's at least intuitively clear to me that there's some sort of relationship between the odds of your component failing and the types of things that can go wrong with it. And so we'd like to tie these up, not just in terms of the map of the system, but also in terms of uh, some additional meaning. And so the first thing we need to do is we kind of need to puff up prob, right? Because we have a collection of failure modes attached to a component, and we need to attach probabilities to these as well if we want to relate it back to the probabilities that we've already got. And so we, again, uh, we use the fact that we can take a monoidal category and use it to build an operad. So it's going to be uh, this uh, monoidal category of stochastic maps. So basically, a, uh, I guess I say it here. So in the op, and we also are going to need an op here. So in the operad, uh, so the objects are finite sets. And again, you want to think of these as being the failure modes. And so we're saying that if I've got failure modes in component 1 and failure modes in component n, and I want to look at the associated failure modes in the, in the top level system for this, uh, for this particular arrow, uh, first of all, we flip things around. And so we say that we get a stochastic map from A into the sum over all of the Bs. And so what that really means is that if you give me an error at the top level, I now give you a distribution over all of the errors at all of the lower level components. And so uh, attaching probabilities to the failure modes then is actually going to correspond to a lifting of this functor that we started with. So uh, fortunately, rel and rel op are uh, equivalent. And so the fact that I was mapping into rel doesn't really matter. I can just stick an op on there and pretend I was doing it all along. And so we started with this guy. Uh, it's, I, I hope, obvious that from, uh, gotcha. I hope it's at least obvious that from a stochastic map, we can get relations by just looking at the things that have non-zero probability. And so what we're really looking at is trying to lift the possi possibilities up to pro uh, probabilities. And so this is obviously the uh, finitary toy version of the stuff that Paolo was talking about on the first day. Uh, OK, but this is actually not quite enough to get back to prob. So uh, right, so we're saying we've got a something like this in Stoke. And we would like to get now a probability distribution just over the components, right? not over the failure modes. And so well, on the right-hand side, we can get down to an n element set by just doing the sort of uh, the typing projection. So it sends everything to b1 to an element, everything in b2 to an element. So that's just a co-product of the uh, unique map to the terminal object. But we still need something else over here if we want to get actually just a probability distribution over n. And so we don't have that yet uh, in Stoke. And so what we do is we actually build a related operad from the one we started with. So uh, 
there's some fairly standard terminology that a point in a category is a map from one uh, from the terminal object into another object. And so we can actually use the points of Stoke to build a, another opera ed. It looks kind of like the other one, but we need an additional condition. It's this uh, commutative diagram down at the bottom. And so what this says, right, so if I go across the top, it says I have some distribution over failure modes at the top. And now I, ha I compose that with my probability distribution over the failure modes of the components. So that gives me one distribution over the failure modes of the components. And that should give me the same thing as if I took the distribution on A, mapped it over to the Bs, and then forgot about all the failure modes and just looked at the probabilities fa of failures on those components. And then I sort of pushed it back up to the failure modes by looking at the points uh, that are associated with the Bs. I hope that makes sense. If not, you guys can ask a question in just a minute. Uh, OK, so now we can actually express the coherence between the probabilistic model and the possibilistic model as some sort of joint lifting condition. Right? So if I have this guy and I have this guy, and I want to give some sort of coherent uh, common interpretation to them, then I think of that as a mapping into the points of Stoke op that commutes uh, in both of these triangles. And that's uh, sort of exactly what we want. And I should actually give a shout out to David Spivak. He came and, give, came and visited us a couple weeks ago. The last section of the paper is actually horrible. It's terrifying. Uh, and he came and helped us, helped me find a better way of thinking about this. So the, the end of the talk would have been much more terrifying if uh, he hadn't come by. Uh, okay, so future work. This is, I got 20 pages into this 12 page paper and realized that I hadn't even gotten to the stuff I wanted to get to, so I have a lot more that I want to do. I basically want to turn this into a maybe a canonical example or at least a, an early example uh, to really work out the methodology of doing this thing for a more complex system. So basically, the LSI is small enough that one person can keep it all in their head at once, but we're interested in applying this to systems where that's not true. And so the things that I want to do uh, to extend this guy is, first of all, you know, we only went one and a half levels deep. That's not nearly enough. Uh, in particular, the chassis, the optics, and the bath all need a lot more uh, refinement and further description in order to give the requirements of the system. Uh, I want to model the system processes. So, so far, we've just got the components and their interactions. I'd also like to model the processes that we go through in order to operate the system, uh, both uh, at the sort of measurement level and also uh, the maintenance level of the of the machine. Uh, I w and if we can do that, then we should be able to express some sort of coherence between scales where I have some sort of uh, process, I, I have some sort of interaction between my process description and my component description at the high level. And this should constrain what's going on at the low level uh, for low level interactions between those things. Uh, I want to attach dynamical semantics to these things and then try and use those dynamical semantics in order to infer the possible failure modes and the uh, and the relations between them from uh, both the requirements and indeed even use, uh, use the control strategies to wiggle our, our actuators in ways that we can try and figure out in a better, uh, try and identify in better ways which component is going wrong. And so there's lots and lots and lots to do, uh, but thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, come and start. what you mean by could. So uh, right now, ev everything is theory. We're really working on methodology. And I'm not expert enough to implement uh, a real system. But maybe I could take yours and use it to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so certainly, uh, in, so uh, for this project, I don't know how much implementation we'll do, we're, we're going to be doing. But obviously, this is, this is the goal. Uh, is that we should be able to write down models like this in silica and then use those to produce the sorts of analyses that we want to do. <coughs> uh, hey, yeah. okay. Can you go back to slide 19? Maybe. Sure. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, yep. Yeah, that looks very monadic. And you have all those functors very low. And I don't know if it helps, but yeah, those are. Well, so I mean, cer certainly, uh, given that we're wor we're working in Stoke and somehow uh, it 
when I, when I think of Stoke, I usually think of it as being defined as a Claisley category. So that's certainly in the background, but I haven't used that fact in any meaningful way. Yeah, so that's essentially exactly what it's doing. It's saying, uh, so before we, we had some sort of notion of if I have this failure, then what are the probabilities of, of uh, failures in the, in the lower level component? Uh, of the lower level elements, uh, what the points are doing is it's adding in sort of an a priori probability of if I know that this component has a failure, what are the a priori, say, historical uh, chances of failure in each of the component for each of the failure modes? Excuse me. Uh, say that again. You mean when I hook the hook the wires together? Uh, no, no, when you specify relationship between two views. Uh, uh, I have been dealing with this and I always use friends in this in this picture? No, from the very beginning. What is the relationship? Uh, uh, you have uh, hierarchy functional architecture and uh, uh, ah, ah yes, yes, yes. Uh well, no, I don't think we're going to get back that far. <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess the way I tend to think of it is, so I, I express it syntactically as an equation in the operad, and then I think we can use that uh, both as a consistency check and as a, an inference rule in the semantics. So basically the fact that I know I have this equation, uh, I can either use it to check some assignments and, and verify that they satisfy that. Or if I have partial information, sometimes I can use that to infer some additional values. I'm not sure that really answered your question. Okay, we'll talk. Yeah. In categorical systems theory, you often have the, the choice between using a lot of categories and using operands. If you're a theorist, it's pretty much like a preference, I think. Can you come in and see if I why, why, why operads rather than monoidal categories, at least to a first approximation? Uh, this is not uh, really uh, mathematically necessary, but at least from an intuitive perspective, I find uh, monoidal categories to be more natural for things that are inherently directed uh, because you have inputs and outputs, even if you're in a hypergraph category where they don't really matter. Uh, whereas an operad is sort of maybe more natively relational and for the sorts of I mean, this is kind of a Williams-style approach, and uh, the relational picture seems more appropriate to me there. Uh, part of it is, uh, even if it's not exactly true, it's often helpful to have some, har some loose rules for explaining to people. String diagrams are for representing processes. Operads are for expressing maps. Even if we know sort of under the hood that we may be able to interchange those. In, oh, sorry. Yeah, just one remark. So, uh, Statebox is built to do exactly this kind of stuff all the way up to the synthesis. So, right now it's just battery nets and what looks like wiring diagrams. Mm -hmm. but they're actually, the, the editor that I showed is like an opera that there's also holes in it. I just didn't show it. So it's exactly the, the idea. It will take a while when we get there. But, uh, I'm, I'm now tempted to ask you a question, but I'll wait until I get down from the yeah. stage. Well, I think So we've got an hour uh, coffee before, before coming back for the discussion. So just thanks, thanks again. Thank you.